Well, I'm not only a Bama fan. Oh, thank you. Go ahead and sit down. Now I feel like I'm under a lot of pressure. I got to make sure I'm worthy of a standing ovation. But of course I'm a Bama fan. I have Bama envy. Anybody who comes from the state of Minnesota, from Minneapolis, Minnesota, we all have Alabama envy. Because when you come down here, it is sweetness. Every, and it isn't just the tea. It is just sweet. The p sweetest people, kindest people, people who love the Lord, who love their country, and are not pretentious. And I don't know why I don't live here. I, I, I've got to go home and ask my husband. Time to retire and move to Alabama. But I'm so thankful to be here, and I really feel like, and I think maybe all of you feel that way, that we are in the presence of giants. I know with Uni Smith, Uni Smith was there from the very beginning with Phyllis Schlafly. Do most of you know who Phyllis Schlafly is? The one who started Eagle Forum? <laughs> Phyllis, Phyllis undisputably is a giant, but the one thing we need to know about giants is they have people around them. They couldn't do what they do without people around them. Uni Smith is probably one of the most important people that Phyllis Schlafly had around her. I don't know if Phyllis could have really done completely what she did and what she accomplished without Uni Smith, who tirelessly gave and is the last person who would ever seek any sort of attention on herself. She's a phenomenal woman, and you deserve that award and 20 more. And I, I, it is very easy to see the honor and the respect with which you hold in high regards, uh, Senator and now General Jeff Sessions. And I know from all around the country, outside of Alabama, the rest of the country felt that way too. Because when we watched him, he talks about a bulldog, when, when he, we watched him as a champion take on the issue in particular of dealing with people who illegally come into the United States, there was nobody, nobody in the Senate that dealt with that issue the way that Senator Sessions dealt with that issue. And we were all there and excited about him and we were so proud when Donald Trump recognized the talent in Jeff Sessions and elevated him to serve our country. We're very proud of him. A true giant. All of you know that Phyllis Schlafly, she's now uh, gone to be with the Lord for about six, seven years now. She's been gone. But yet her shadow still is over the United States of America. I remember back when I was in college. <laughs> when I was in college, I was sitting in a, uh, in a class, and our professor was talking to the women in the class. This would have been in the mid-1970s, and he was saying to us, what's wrong with you women? You're not out there fighting for the ERA move, uh, bill. You're not out there marching in the streets to get ERA passed. Hard to believe now that was a state college, and nobody was out there agitating. We didn't agitate back then. We worked to pay our school bills, and we went to school. We didn't have time to agitate. So it was a little bit different situation. But, um, but he was urging all of us to get behind the ERA. Honestly, I was so dumb, I had no idea what the ERA was. I'd never heard of it. I didn't care. I wasn't political. I was just trying to uh, work and get through college and get my degree. And uh, as time went on, I started reading Phyllis Schlafly's Phyllis Schlafly reports. Did any of you ever read those or ever read her writing? She would write these essays where she packed them with so much information, you practically felt like you were a PhD by the time you finished reading just one of her newsletters. And you could take every statement she wrote to the bank. It was incredible and filled with meat. And with the data that she had, you could take that and go out and uh, champion any argument you wanted to champion. She was a giant, and she was a forward thinker. She was like a prophet in a lot of ways, because she understood the implications of the ERA amendment like nobody else understood. She knew what it would mean for America. She knew how women in the United States would ultimately be hurt if the ERA passed. 
And she defeated it, not single-handedly, but she led almost single-handedly that defeat. What she saw is really what we're dealing with today. Because Phyllis Schlafly saw and understood already in the 60s and in the 70s this movement to a genderless society. That's the whole game right now, isn't it? How much did we hear about that even in the lead up to this last election? We haven't heard the end of it. And congratulations on what's happening here in fighting back against the DOJ. Give yourselves a round of applause. That's Eagle Forum that was able to pass that bill in, in Alabama and now that motion was quashed from the DOJ. We have to continue to pray into this because the other side isn't going to let up. Because for whatever weird reason, I still can't say I understand it, they want to see us be genderless. In other words, what are we supposed to do? Think of like the Cultural Revolution in the 1960s with, with Mao. And what happened? They're, they all have the same haircut. They're all wearing the same clothes. Everybody looks and sounds genderless. Is that what they're trying to push here? A society where we're a communist society, where there's no differences and no gender distinction. It is the most bizarre agenda I have ever heard of. Who benefits from a genderless society? Phyllis Schlafly saw that. Can you believe that? That early on as a prophet, she warned about it. She defeated it with the ERA amendment. The other thing Phyllis wrote about a lot, because she was a giant, she could see the direction that this country was going to go with what General Sessions referred to, and that's the globalism. We're seeing now a move toward one world government like we've never seen before. It's being led by corporations, as the general said. It's also being led by governments, including our government. Just today and yesterday, the uh, B20 and the G20, the B20 are 20 of the top global corporations in the world. So as you can imagine, Bill Gates was present for this. Klaus Schwab from the World Economic Forum, if you're familiar with them, he was present for that. And then the G20 was there meeting as well. What was on their agenda? Well, at their agenda, the health minister of Indonesia said, it is now time and the nations have come together and we're going to meet this spring and this summer in Geneva, Switzerland, and we are going to put forward the directive from the World Health Organization that we are going to have digitized passports that will be in our phone, that will have all of our testing data and all of our vaccine data so that we're prepared when the next pandemic comes. So do these people know something we don't know? Wondering. But this is what they're pushing. At the same time, we're looking at the rollout of a pilot program with the, with the New York Federal Reserve and a big banking conglomerate to have a 12-week pilot program on digital currency that's programmable. So what that means is your money is now no longer exactly your money because the Federal Reserve, when it's programmable, somebody else can hit a kill switch on your money and they decide, so you don't have cash anymore, it's all digital, it's all in your phone, and they can decide if you can spend your money at certain places and not spend your money at other places. I mean, it's a level of control none of us have even pondered before. But the same thing is true with the digital passport on health care. Because on that passport, there's a tracking mechanism to follow wherever we are and wherever we move. Do you remember in this last go around, we had the tracing. Different governments came up with this idea that you had to be traced for where you go. Now, maybe that seemed like a good idea to you at the time, but think of the implications. When we have in our phone, and the government has the ability 
through central banks, but also through centralized health care, to follow us and to tell us we can't move. We can't move because the health director of Indonesia said today, or else it was yesterday, that now when we have our next pandemic, it doesn't mean that everybody will have to be grounded from planes. Just some people. Just the people who don't submit themselves to the vaccines or to the testing or whatever we come up with on any given day. That's a profound sense of power. You literally are giving people the power of life and death. What's the worst thing about all of this is not just all of these oddball James Bond sounding ideas like Blofeld and his hollowed out Alp in the Swiss mountains in a James Bond movie. There's always bad actors that always have really terrible ideas. The worst thing about all of this is the fact that we don't get to vote on it. These big, great ideas keep coming. They, they're the dream child of people associated with the World Economic Forum or the World Health Organization or at the UN. This is not bottom-up ideas coming from the grassroots up, and we get to vote on it in our school boards, and we get to vote on it in our counties, and we get to vote in it in the state legislature, and we get to vote it on it at the national level. That is gone. This is all the big ideas that are just being pushed down upon us from global organizations where there's no voting. It's just a couple of people, usually multi-multi-billionaires, who decide the way that the world is going to be, jam it down our throats, and say, eat that for lunch. And we have no say. I'll tell you, that is not the United States of America. That's not Alabama. That's not the world that we live on. That is not the rule book of the Declaration of Independence, of the Constitution of the United States. It's not reflective of the Bill of Rights. It's not reflective of anything that is the world that we have known for nearly 250 years in the United States. And so we need to have a voice. And that's why I was so grateful for what General Sessions said. This whole idea of canceling people's voices and taking away from them their right to speak into the issues of the day. These aren't small things. These are big things. And so this is where we've got to have a voice. So whether our voice is on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or local radio or the new newspaper that's coming out here in Alabama, we have to have a voice. We have to have a voice in church. We have to have a voice at work. We have to have a voice within our family. Because things are happening fast. Faster than we could have ever thought before. That's kind of a gloom and doom picture of what it seems like things are planned for us. But I want to give you this picture too. Because the giants that have been in our midst have often been people of faith. Phyllis Schlafly was a person of faith. And just a few months ago, we saw something that, that was so unique. It was after 70 years of reign as the monarch of England, Queen Elizabeth passed. And many of us watched with great respect her funeral. And if you happen to be one of the billion or so who tuned in that day, you saw a flag draped coffin uh, with the Union Jack over it. And it was down in the very front of the church. There's very little emphasis, not really much of a word at all, about Queen Elizabeth herself and what she had done during her 70 years, the longest sitting monarch ever in the history of England. Very little about her. The church service was really about Jesus Christ and the gospel. The church service was about the fact that this is the one that she knew as the head of the Church of England. She took that role, defender of the faith, extremely important. Queen Elizabeth was a giant, another giant. Her giant nature came from her humility 
and her willingness to recognize that the God of the universe, the Jehovah God of the Bible, is Lord. And she submitted herself to him. But she was also a great student of England, their history, and their constitution, which isn't a written constitution. It's hard for us to understand, but she was a great student of it at Eton College when she went as a student. And she understood that her role in England, in her role in all of that, is that the government is on his shoulders. That's what the Bible says, that the government is on God's shoulders. And she understood that God, government comes from God. God is the one who governs over the affairs of men and nations. And so we don't have a monarchy. We're a constitutional republic. But in their system of a monarchy, she serves in what's known as the divine right of kings. And so she received her position not just as an as a automatic. The gift of government settled on her shoulders. It came from God and went on her shoulders. And if you recall, if you watch the funeral, her flag-draped coffin had three pillars, pillows on top of the coffin. On one pillow lay her scepter, which represented her ability to be able to rule over her people. The second pillow had the crown, that she was from the line and the lineage and the crown and the burden of that crown was on her shoulders. It was no longer her will. If any of you saw that Netflix series or if you've, if you've watched The Crown, so much of what you see in that is this is a woman, a sovereign, who made the decision that she would subdue her will to the greater will which is for the people of the nation. And so the decisions that she made were under law for the benefit of the nation. That's how we used to be in the United States of America. She took that very seriously. The third pillow held the orb, a round piece of metal that she would hold in her hands. And what the orb signified is that she was the defender of the faith. So she had current rule, she was part of the lineage with the crown, but in her other hand was the orb, the church, the gospel of Jesus Christ, which she had received. She'd invited Billy Graham into Windsor Castle, and he shared the gospel with her, and every time that she ever knew that he was going to come again, she always asked him to come and preach in Windsor Castle. She wanted him to preach to her. She needed it for her own soul. This was a faithful woman who led. And she was faithful because of the power of Jesus Christ in her life and the power of Jesus Christ that was the bedrock of the British kingdom. All that they had was laid on the bedrock of Jesus Christ. So too here in the United States. It's our firm foundation, too. We're a Judeo-Christian nation because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel created greatness in Phyllis Schlafly, greatness in the Queen of England. And at the conclusion of her funeral service, the master of Windsor lifted the scepter off of the, her coffin and put it back on the altar to signify that her rule was now complete on this earth, what God had asked of her. And it was returned back to God for him to give to the next person of his choice. And the crown was taken off of the coffin and put back on the altar, given back to God. No rule ever belongs to a human. It always belongs to God. And the same with orb, it went back to the altar. You see, whether we're a monarchy, whether we're a constitutional republic, whatever form of government we are, the Bible will always be true, that the government is upon his shoulders. 
And that's why for this time that we're in right now, a very confusing time that makes no sense, the results of this election make zero sense from what they came across. And I want to just encourage you to realize that God has not abandoned us. God is with us. The Bible is clear and promises his banner over us is love. And so we don't in any way deviate from our understanding that here in the United States of America, the government is on his shoulders. And the more that we dedicate ourselves to prayer and fasting for our nation and pray for our leaders, whether we voted for them or not, whether we like them or not, the more that we pray and fast and we cry out to God for this nation, he will have his way with them. He will have this way. And he will not be mocked. Just this last week, the election occurred, and two days after the election, Joe Biden got on a plane, and he left D.C., to go to Sharm el-Sheikh, Egypt. He was going for the COP27 conference. That was the climate change conference that was sponsored by the United Nations. This was a creepy conference, a really creepy conference. And Phyllis Schlafly talked about these, these um, conferences and agendas as well. They've been planning this for a long time, but this one, was, this one was really creepy. Because in it, they brought up the topic of reparations, and they're serious about it. And Joe Biden is all in for the United States to be a part of this. The new Prime Minister of England, Rish, Rishi Sunak, is also all in. They're demanding reparations for the countries that innovated and created all of the manufacturing, the techniques that have lifted literally billions of people out of poverty, the gifts that we have been given to the world, now America is expected to pay reparations. The UK is expected to pay reparations to so-called developing countries. And by the way, China is considered one of those developing countries. So we're supposed to be writing trillion dollar checks for these people to cash. In one of the biggest uh, redistribution of wealth sc scams on a global level. Like we have trillions of dollars sitting around that we can give when we're $31 trillion in debt already. So they demanded reparations, but here's the thing that was probably the most disgusting. They rolled out a one world religion last week at this conference when President Biden was there. They took what I would say phony Christian, phony Jew, phony Muslim representatives, and they went to what is known as the historic site of Mount Sinai. And they went to Mount Sinai, about a hundred of them, and climbed up Mount Sinai to give to the world what they are receiving from God, which is the Ten Commandments of Earth Worship. And so this is something that I think you don't fool with. When you start passing off a new Ten Commandments that you are giving to the world for earth worship. And the gist of what they said is this. You can all have your own religion as long as you have these t Ten Commandments as the first part of your religion. As long as you're all on board with these Ten Commandments of earth worship, then you can all have your own religion. This is the direction that we're going. And so I think this is probably the greatest time to be alive. These are the days that the prophets long to see, the days that we're living in right now. And so I would encourage everyone, this is a time to be in prayer, to look up and see the times that we're living in, because when people start mocking God to the extent of blaspheming about the Ten Commandments, when people are mocking God for how he made man and female and denying that he made us male and female, when we're at the very essence of what the Word of God says, then you know a nerve is struck. And so I think actually I, I am not depressed, I'm not upset, I don't spend 10 seconds on if it's going to be Trump or DeSantis, I don't spend any time on that. That's going to work itself out because 
God will not be mocked. And the people who are currently occupying these places of importance in governments, it's him that they have to answer to. And so that's why when... <laughs> that's why when you have an organization like Eagle Forum that's been as successful as it's been. This is a small organization with a very tiny budget. And when you see what they have accomplished, not only here in this legislative body, but nationally in the, in the national body, I will tell you, you can give money to candidates. We have candidates here. We have office holders here. That's a great thing. I've been there. Senator General Sessions has been there. But when you give money to an organization like Eagle Forum, I am telling you, it's a guaranteed 1,000% return on your investment. Because that money actually is used to change things in your backyard, with your school board, and with all the things that impact you and your business and your kids. And so if you haven't given money yet, I really want you to think about it very strongly. We saw $16.7 billion thrown in the wind in this last election. $16.7 billion. Just imagine, a little bit of money with a great, trusting, wonderful organization like an Eagle Forum and what that money can do and be multiplied. So I'm so proud to be here, so proud to be with all of you. And I know I'm going to go and fill out my change of address form. And I can't wait to move to Alabama. God bless you. Bye-bye.